At number 15, we have Keely Teslow and Phil Diffie from Phil of the Future. Phil! You're still here. D does that mean you're not going? No, no, I'm still going. Oh. I didn't want to leave without saying goodbye for real. Then, uh... Give... I gotta go, my my dad's waiting in the time machine. Uh oh. time machine ride at the amusement park. Goodbye. In the future will you wait for me? Really? Cause well you'd be really, really old. But that shouldn't matter. See you, Becker. See you, Salt. In, uh... In other news... Oh, we all know nothing's gonna top that. After all these years, these two are still my Disney Channel OTP. The boy from the future and the girl who needed tutoring in maths. Fellow of the Future is still one of my favourite Disney shows. It was so much fun with its silly time travel and futuristic tech and the live-in caveman. But at the heart of the show were these two and their friendship, which everyone could see was actually a romance. Kelly and Phil were inseparable and they were always happiest when they were with each other. They went on virtual dates, babysat feral children, went to school dances, spent Christmas together and supported each other whenever things got rough. Kelly was the only person Phil ever told his secret to and Phil was the only person that Kelly could sing in front of. They carved their names into a tree and it was still there in a hundred years time. They were the most pure friends to lovers ship and I adore them. It's kind of funny that my two biggest Disney Channel ships, teenage ones anyway, Beck and Boy aside, didn't entirely get a happy ending. We never did see if Sonny and Chad got back together at the end of Sonny with a Chance and we never find out if Keely and Phil managed to make their relationship work after Phil returned to the future, but I'm sure they did. I refuse to believe anything else. Phil said that he would wait for her and I don't believe that anything could ever keep them apart. I love the fact that Phil of the Future was a bit different to the other Disney shows. The setup is usually like three friends or a family unit. Liz McGuire, That's So Raven, Hannah Montana, Good Luck Charlie, Wizards of Waverly Place. But with Phil, it really was just Phil and Keely. It was their story. The way that their friendship blossomed into love. That's what makes it so enjoyable to watch. It was a Disney Channel love story. At number 14, we have Carlos Rodriguez and Sebastian Matthew Smith from High School Musical, the musical, the series. And all of my life I've been to the status quo Don't let anybody see who you again. are You came along and suddenly I'm home If forever's not a fairy tale, I hope you're my forever If we fall again, I'll make it through I'll be there to carry you over and over and again, all over again. Yeah. God, I feel so lucky to have found something that's real Cause I'm lost without your love and love You taught me how to feel If we fall again, we'll make it through I'll be there to carry you over and over again over. know by now how unhinged I am when it comes to High School Musical the musical the series. I am not normal about this show at all and I'm even more not normal when it comes to Seblos. It's so rare for Disney to have a gay couple and like a proper one not that LeFou fancies Gaston malarkey but Seblos were that couple. They fell in love at the High School Musical rehearsals. Carlos was the director's assistant, Seb was playing Sharpay. Yes really it was everything. Carlos is the quintessential sassy gay for whom life is always a struggle and Seb is the human golden retriever with very few thoughts in his head and they make the funniest, most adorable couple ever. Carlos brings Seb out of his shell and Seb reigns Carlos in when he's being overdramatic, which is all the time. 
And what's really so great about these two is that they're a couple in real life as well. Actors Joe Serafini and Frankie Rodriguez fell in love almost instantly on the set. As Frankie puts it, Joe was sitting playing a piano between scenes and Frankie thought, oh no, I'm going to have a crush on him. And he did. But it worked out because Joe liked him back. And you can definitely see elements of their real life relationship and their characters. They really are obsessed with the Real Housewives. I thought that was just a joke for the show, but no, like they are obsessed. If you go on their Instagram, they are obsessed with the Real Housewives. <laughs> People took issue with their relationship in season four because Seb kisses someone else whilst Carlos is at camp and then kind of acts as if Carlos did something wrong, although at that point he also thought that Carlos had cheated on him. It's a whole thing. But honestly, it didn't bother me as much as it did so many people. They worked through it and they came out stronger in the end and when Seb stormed onto the stage to kiss Carlos in front of everyone, including his father, who at the time he assumed was homophobic, it made up for everything. It was everything. It's gonna be There's a reason that Over Again is my favourite High School Musical The Musical The Series song of all time. It's just so good. <laughs> At number 13 we have Beth Turner and Mick St. John from Moonlight. If you hadn't been a vampire, I'd have died today. I'd have died 23 years ago. Being a vampire isn't all you are. It's not what's keeping us apart. It's just you. never go over the cancellation of Moonlight. Like in some ways I'm glad that it has 16 perfect episodes and had a proper ending and that nothing can ever tarnish that. It will always exist as this perfect show that was just a flash in the pan and, and just was what it was. But it deserves so much more. Mick St. John is a vampire private detective who looks 30 but has been alive for like 80 years. And Beth Turner is a local reporter who crosses paths with Mick when they're both investigating the same case. Except that's not actually the first time that they've met. Beth was kidnapped as a child and she's always wondered who the man was who rescued her. Spoiler alert, it was Mick. And the woman who kidnapped Beth was Mick's wackadoodle ex-wife who turned him into a vampire. I realise that it's kind of weird that Mick falls in love with someone that he's like first met as a small child. But it's romantic, okay? Don't think about it too much. Like, don't let that... D shut up. It's, it's romantic, okay? <laughs> anyway, Mick and Beth end up becoming friends and team up in a bunch of cases and very quickly develop feelings for each other. But Mick feels like he can't be with her because she's a human and he isn't. But then he becomes human and they can finally have a normal relationship. They He can even eat food with her. They go for a picnic. But then Beth gets kidnapped again and the only way that Mick can save her is to become a vampire again. So he gives up his only chance of humanity for her. It's devastating. He didn't even get to try a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> but ultimately they are still in love and the series ends with them getting together anyway. They'll figure it out eventually. The Buffy fandom might see Lucky as a Buffy song, but for me it's the song of a totally different vampire series. I can't hear Lucky without thinking of Beth and Mick. At number 12, we have Eric Beale and Nell Jones from NCIS Los Angeles. Hey, Nell. What's, what's going on here, Beale? What? Um, nothing. I don't... What do you mean? Like, with you and the level of awkwardness, it's more than usual. The situation has come up. 
and it's a business thing, but not like a business, business thing. It's like the universe or Yoda or whatever higher power you believe in telling me to do something that I have wanted to do for a while. Okay. But I don't know if I can because I don't want you to think that it's just a financial decision and not because... Because what? Because I've never been this happy and I never want to be somewhere where you aren't. Wow, that is ridiculous. Ridiculously cute, but I'm still pretty confused. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Maybe I should just blurt it out. Ooh. You should. Just blurt. Okay. Yeah. My landlord is selling my place. And I need to move out. Uh -huh. And I want to find a new place, but like a nice place, mm -hmm. right? But I don't want you to think that I'm asking you what I'm about to ask you right. just because my landlord got a sweet deal on a condo in Ala Moana and needs that money to move to Hawaii. I would love to move in with you. Really? Really? Where should we live? <gasps> should we get a dog? Beal, brats, beer, onward. Okay, wait, we work long hours. Maybe we should get a cat, a cat. I definitely have types when it comes to shipping and two techie characters who support the main team is definitely one of them. Nell and Eric are like the more upbeat live action version of Sean and Rebecca and I'll never be able to get over that. <laughs> it's all I see when I look at them. The other characters refer to them as the Wonder Twins because they are pretty much joined at the hip as well as calling them squirrels because they are. They are the sweetest, dorkiest pairing ever. They spend years dancing around their feelings for each other before finally getting together and moving in together. And then the writers pull some nonsense out of their asses about how Nell feels like they move too fast and she doesn't want to break up, but she doesn't want them to be having labels and like she doesn't want them to be labeled as boyfriend and girlfriend because she just wants them to be them, whatever that means. I just pretend that never happened because it's like, what? But other than that, they were just constant good vibes. No drama, no games, no breaking up and getting back together. Just no drama, no games, no breaking up and getting back together or silliness like that. Just two genuinely lovely people who loved each other. Get a guy who looks at you the way that Eric Beale looks at Penelope Jones. At number 11, we have Corey Matthews and Topanga Lawrence from Boy Meets World and Girl Meets World. Okay, Corey, you educate me. You tell me what love means to you. Mom, listen, I haven't been together with the Panga for 22 years, but we have been together for 16. Okay, that's a lot longer than most couples have been together. I mean, when we were born, you told me that we used to take walks in our strollers together around the block. When we were two, we were best friends. I mean, I, I knew everything about this girl. I knew her favorite color. I knew her favorite food. And then we got to be six, you know, and, and Eric, they made fun of me because it wasn't cool to have a best friend that's a girl or to even know a girl. Yeah, and you listen to me, idiot. <laughs> so for the next seven years, I threw dirt at her. I like to call those the lost years. You were the one who made him throw dirt at me? You were a girl, noogie head. <laughs> and then when I was 13, Mom, she put me up against my locker. She kissed me. I mean, she, she gave me my first kiss. She taught me how to dance. She, she always was talking about these crazy things and I never understood a, a word she said. All I understood was that she was the girl I sat up every night thinking about. And I'm, when I'm with her, I feel happy to be alive. Like I, like I can do anything. Even talk to you like this. So that's, that's what I think is love, Mom. When I'm better because she's here. Look, I know in the cold light of day we've all reflected on Corey and Topanga's roller coaster of our relationship and realised that it was kind of an unhealthy disaster. But they were my childhood, okay? I only watched Girl Meets World originally to see them again. I've been rewatching I've actually been rewatching Boy Meets World recently and I've just finished the Disney World episode and I was just like a big pile of giggles at the end when they kissed in front of the fountain. I know they weren't perfect, but they were tied by the invisible string. There was no one else for either of them. They were taken. Watching Cory go from seeing Topanga as this weird girl to realising that she's actually fun to be around, to becoming her friend, to falling head over heels in love with her, and then eventually marrying her, it was just everything. 
And I would die for Topanga Lawrence on any day of the week. She is my girl. And how many love stories do you get where you, you start watching them when they are 11 years old and you're still watching them together as adults with a 15 year old daughter? Very few, that's how many. I grew up with Cory and Topanga and their love will always be timeless. She trekked back to Philadelphia from Pittsburgh in the rain to be with him. She proposed to him at their high school graduation. She had his baby back ribs and also his actual babies. They are a mess, but they are my mess. At number 10, we have Rebecca Holiday and Sex from Generator Rex. Holiday, Rebecca, you are the strongest, smartest woman I have ever met and the most stubborn. You never give up. If there is a way to help your sister, Find it. Now. That's my girl. I also ship Rex and Cersei, and if I'm honest, Rex and Noah, but my ultimate generator Rex, OTP, is Sex and Holiday. I love these two. This is the definition of the grumpy one is in love with the sunshine one. Sex is the most... Sex is the sixth most dangerous man in the world. He doesn't show a lot of emotion, but when he loves someone, he will face God and walk backwards into hell for them. And never is that truer than with Rebecca Holiday. Holiday is a scientist. She's an optimist who believes in a better world, while Six has to live in this one. And they basically become Rex's parents. Somehow this soldier and the scientist end up raising a teenage boy together. Somehow this soldier and the scientist end up raising a teenage superhero together. They have so many adorable moments across the series and I have every one of them catalogued in my brain. But the one I always think of is when there's like this, I can't remember if it was sand or like sludge, but it's going to kill them. And the two of them are trapped together. And later in the episode when it melts away, we see the two of them are holding hands. They held hands while they were dying. <laughs> It's too much. I am all too unwell. <laughs> What's so great about these two is that because the writers are maniacs, Six ends up losing his memory at one point and he never gets it back. Alexa, play Losing Your Memory by Ryan Starr. But even after this, he falls in love with Holiday again because they were soulmates. You can take Six's memories, but you cannot take away his love for Rebecca Holiday. I love them so much and now I need to rewatch Generator Rex. At number nine, we have Anthony Lockwood and Lucy Carlisle from Lockwood and Co. You believe me? I do. About everything. You know I don't actually want the spotlight, right? Maddening. I suppose it would make me uh, quite the asset, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm not going to make that mistake again. We'll go carefully. I promise. This is the most recent ship on this list, but despite only having them for eight episodes, fuck you, Netflix. I already have a playlist for them on Spotify. I love them so much. I love that show so much. And I look forward to reading the books and finding out what would have happened if Netflix didn't suck. I think I wasn't bored from this ship right from those very first scenes when they're trying to find the ghosts in the old lady's house. At one point, Lucy sort of like jumps into Lockwood's arms and I was just, I was sold. And they only got better as the series went on. Lockwood, the guy who keeps all his feelings inside, but is so clearly and unwaveringly in love with Lucy. And Lucy, the broken bird who watched all her friends die and her best friend fall into a permanent vegetative coma, whose mother abused her, who walked out of home at 16 years old looking for a new life and found her true home at Lockwood's side. The fact that I'll never get to see their relationship play out on screen will infuriate me for the rest of my life. I don't think any show cancellation has ever hurt me as bad as this since Witch. <laughs> I was in the full five stages of grief over the loss of Lockwood and Co. And I think about Lucy in the blue dress with her forehead against Lockwood's just every day of the week. 
And to find out that in the books he eventually says, come off it, you know I die for you? Help! <laughs> At number eight we have Dr. Perry Cox and Jordan Sullivan from Scrubs. Since Jordan had prenatal surgery, she'd been on bed rest. Dr. Cox, however, was not. Okay, I made you breakfast. The kitchen's as clean as a whistle. I'm gonna drop Jack off at daycare on the way to work. Is there anything else I can do for you? I need you to go to the video store and get me anything with Vigo something scent. I need white chocolate, strawberry seltzer, peppercorn brie, and a Polaroid of the tomato plant that I planted last spring because I'm worried it may have snails. Oh, and if you see that neighbor Lena from down the hall, I want you to roll your eyes and say the word slut under your breath, but loud enough so she can hear. And don't forget to be home by 6.30 because you gotta give Jack his bath before you make my dinner. But when will I have time to kill myself? That's not my problem. A friend of mine once said, I'd like to say our relationship is like Marshall and Lily, but it's more like Dr. Cox and Jordan. And I said, well, that's a good thing because Dr. Cox and Jordan have a far better relationship than Marshall and Lily ever did. I absolutely love these two. They are my favourite characters in Scrubs and their relationship is just endlessly entertaining. Not only is their dynamic so funny, but they have a really beautiful love story. They get married, then realise that they're unhappy, so they get divorced. But they can never quite quit each other, so they still sleep together on occasion. Eventually Jordan gets pregnant, but she tells Perry it isn't his. Despite that, he still says he wants to support her and help her with the baby. And then it's revealed that the baby is his. She just wanted him to choose to be with her rather than be with her out of obligation to their baby. Then they discover that they're still married, but they feel weird about it, so they have a divorce ceremony in the park. Then they have a second baby together, and it's just all so beautiful. They are the epitome of a couple who are together because no one else in the world would ever put up with either of them. They are both so chaotic and so unhinged and just perfect for each other. From antics like tying up the doctor who botched Perry's vasectomy and forcing him to listen to Ted's band sing the baby back ribs jingle. Go Ted. I want my baby back, 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 they are truly just the funniest and most enjoyable couple in the show and somehow have one of the healthiest relationships I've ever seen. My idols. At number seven, we have Leah Dama and Cara Thrace, aka Apollo and Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica. I just want you to know, Cara, that I'm your friend. I love you. If there's anything you want to talk about, anything you want to get off your chest, then I'm here for you. Whenever you want to talk, just, just let me know. What was that middle part again? Hmm? What do you mean? Did you say you love me? <laughs> well, um... Leah Dama loves me. No, all I meant was... No, seriously. Very sweet. You love me. <laughs> no, you love me. You can't take it back. There's no take backs. You're dreaming you, it, Kara. You love me. You're dreaming it. You love me. Dreamer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Katie Sackhoff once describes Lee and Kara as soulmates who weren't meant to be together, and I think that really sums up this pairing. At first, I didn't ship Lee and Kara. Lee's father, Bill, refers to Kara as his daughter, so I felt like it would be a bit incestuous to ship them. But then at the start of season two, when Starbuck returns to Galactica, Lee just straight up runs to her and like kisses her. And that's when I realised that I actually did ship them. <laughs> I shipped them hard. And that was me in hell for the rest of the series. Starbuck and Apollo have one of the most chaotic relationships I have ever seen in anything and it isn't healthy. I know it isn't healthy. But it isn't exactly toxic either. They're just both walking disasters. I must screw up Lee. Try to keep that in mind. Kara is known for sleeping with pretty much any man who offers, and that's sort of how her feelings for Lee developed. Kara was actually engaged to Lee's brother, Zack. That's why Bill sees her like a daughter. 
she was supposed to be his daughter-in-law. But one night when Lee came over for dinner, him and Kara had eye contact. And after Zach passed out, the pair went off to have sex on the dinner table, but they were interrupted. And according to the writers, Lee and Kara were trapped in that moment forever, never quite able to take their next step, but not able to let it go either. Forever just on that dining table, on the precipice of something, but never able to go over the edge. And it never gets any better. Kara falls for a man named Sam Anders, who she later assumes is dead, but when he comes back, it throws her complex feelings for Lee into turmoil. But then Lee marries Dee, another person on the ship. But Lee says he'll divorce Lee if Kara will go all in on their relationship. And she agrees. But then she panics. And not able to reconcile her feelings for Lee, she instead marries Sam. Basically to force her to never be able to call for Lee again. If she's in a marriage and she believes in the sanctity of marriage, then she has to cut off her romantic entanglement with Lee. Permanently. And Lee, realising that him and Kara are officially over, decides to stay with Dee. But it doesn't matter that they're married to other people, because Lee and Kara's feelings never go away. Lee and Kara never do get their shit together, and maybe they weren't supposed to, but they never stop being in love. They never stop putting each other first, and if that's not what Galactica's about in a nutshell, I don't know what is. Humans are not robots, they are complex, layered beings with complicated feelings. They mess up, they make mistakes, and sometimes they fall in love with more than one person. But maybe it's not the end of the world. Maybe that's just how humans are supposed to be. But God damn it, Kara, you come back will rip my heart out every single time I think about it for the rest of my life. As well, goodbye Kara Thrace, you will not be forgotten. At number six, we have Kenzie Bly and Martin Deeks from NCIS Los Angeles. Deeks. Is he? Hey, you okay? Oh, baby. Kenz, look at me. You did good today. Good. I love you. I love you too. It's all that matters. in my honourable mentions in my previous video which was truly such a mistake. I hadn't watched NCIS LA in years at that point and I was five seasons behind and I guess I just kind of forgot how much I love them but having jumped back in and watched three more seasons since I made that video I can safely say that I'm an idiot and that they are everything. I love the dynamic these two have, always poking fun at each other, being silly, making jokes and just having a great time but when things do go south when the room is about to explode or burn down around them, my god, they do emotional better than any other fictional couple I've ever seen. Kenzie dragging Deke's lifeless body through the desert and telling him that he's heavy and then breaking down crying and begging him to wake up just sent me into a tailspin for days. And if I rewatched it now, I'm sure it would do it again. They are also just like the most beautiful people that ever lived. Like genuinely, they look so good together. They are just stunning individuals. <laughs> I love NCIS LA in general, but I can't lie, I always prefer it when an episode has a lot of Denzi because they are just so entertaining to watch. Even if an episode isn't really about them, there's always some wonderful Denzi content in there and, and it's just so good. Also, not that it matters whether the actors who play characters get along in real life, but we all kind of hope that they do. And these two definitely do because they're actually in-laws. Danielle Arua, who plays Kenzie, is married to Eric Olsen, who plays Deke's brother, Christopher. And how did they meet? Because Eric introduced them, saying that they were his favourite people and he just wanted them to be happy and he thought that they might be happy together. And now they're all one big happy family and their kids are cousins, which in fairness is kind of weird because any time that Kenzie and Deke's talk about getting pregnant in the show, I just kind of think about like, but your kids are cousins. Uh, but it's so cute in real life. And even though the show is finished now, you know that Daniela and Eric are stuck together for life. And that is very nice to think about. <laughs> 
Into the top five now, and at number five on the list, we have Steve McGarrett and Danny Williams, aka McDano, from Hawaii Five-O. All right, please tell me I'm not alone in, in, in how I feel about this. This whole thing is just ridiculous. Are you kidding me? Diet plans, a treadmill desk? The self-regulating de-stress modulator, whatever she said, you having to self-censor? Please. So you're not gonna take any of her advice? No, because it's silly. That's good. It's a waste of my money, a waste of her time. Let me ask you a question. What's with micromanaging my health all of a sudden? What's going on? Okay, because I'm scared that you're not taking this seriously. Why would you say that? You told me that you had radiation poisoning. It was You were very casual. It was like uh, you were telling me you had uh, eczema or something like that. I mean, it's the same thing with the liver. I give you my liver, you don't follow any of the post-op instructions. You don't take nothing seriously. That's why. You're exaggerating. Right? You're over-exaggerating. I'm not over-exaggerating. I am genuinely scared for your health, okay? I lay up at night. I'm sick about it. I can't sleep. I almost called that therapist to try to get another session. Why would you say something to me? What am I going to say to you? That, that I'm stressed about the fact that you are not taking this thing seriously about your own health? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to put that on you. It's my own thing. What am, what am I going to say to you? I'm scared, too. I know I don't, I, don't, I don't show it, but deep down, I'm scared. You think I don't want to live a long life? You think I don't want to maybe get married someday, have my own kids? I love your kids, all right? Charlie, Gracie, I want to watch them watch, grow up. I want to see Joni grow up. I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to obsess over something that might happen, and I can't let you do that either. I'm serious about this. And there's one other thing. Please, whatever she said to you, don't, don't do that. Don't change. I love you, man, the way you are. I need it to stay that way, all right? BFFs, you remember? Yeah, forever, you know that. Well, it actually, that's what it actually means, it's best friends forever, but... You just did it then. I know, I did it oh, on purpose. Okay, well, it's dismissive is all I'm trying to say. What's dismissive? Well, when you roll your eyes, it feels dismissive. Well, sometimes I feel... you say things that deserve an eye roll. I don't, I don't think, yeah, maybe you. they deserve an eye roll, but do I deserve to be dismissed? I keep saying I'm going to make a video about how Peter Lenkov queer he does for 10 years with this pairing, and I will. But today we're not talking about queer baiting. We're just talking about how this Navy commander and this Jersey cop ruined my life for a full decade. Also, if McGarrett looks familiar to you, it's because his actor has already been on this list. He's Mick St. John from Moonlight. Actually, the only reason that me and my mum watched Hawaii Five-0 in the first place back in 2010 was because we loved Moonlight and we wanted to see Alex O'Loughlin. And then it turned out that this show gave me an even bigger ship than Moonlight had. Isn't it funny how life works? I was truly unhinged in my obsession with these two. Like, I remember one summer holiday at school. I like would sit all day whilst my mum was out of work and I had the house to myself and I would just watch Hawaii Five-0, watch McDonald fan videos, read McDonald fan fiction. Like I was in the deepest fandom trenches. I think that was the worst I've ever been in terms of a fandom, like just truly in, in the trenches. And like then I'd sit all through Sunday waiting for 9pm when Hawaii Five-0 would be on and I could find out what new McDonald content I was adding to my shipper filing cabinet. I truly don't care what Peter Lankoff says. Danny and Steve were in love. Uh, they knew it. The fans knew it. Even the actors knew it. They literally kept saying, I love you to each other. And I'm not like trying to say, like I'm, I'm all for men being more open about loving their friends. But come on. If this had been a show with a male and a female lead, there would have been no question that this was romantic. The only reason that people said that it wasn't romantic was just because it was two men. It's just the biggest case of no homo I've ever seen. They literally ran into fires, collapsing buildings, war zones, hails of bullets and explosions for each other. Steve has part of Danny's liver in his body. Danny flew the whole team to Korea to rescue Steve. They call each other babe all the time. They snuggle on the couch, even when one of their girlfriends was on the couch with them, they were snuggling into each other on the same couch. They went to a couple's retreat. They opened a restaurant together. They pretended to be married for a case. They're literally walking fan fiction tropes. I do not care what Peter Lenkov says. They got married and lived together on the beach in Hawaii and that is the truth. At number four, we have Eve Baird and Flynn Carson from The Librarians. Life, we were less than five minutes into the show and I was like, if these two don't get married, I'm going to jump off a cliff. And I was expecting some kind of will they, won't they nonsense like every other show does. You know, like Castle and Beckett, Jane and Lisbon, Maddie and David, that kind of thing. But no, Eve just full on grabs him and kisses him at the end of the second episode and they just stay together for the rest of the series. 
I always say the librarians is like if you ran my brain through a machine and asked it to churn out like the perfect TV show for me, it would produce the librarians. It really is made for me. And these two are part of it. It's so nice to see a healthy relationship running through a series. And they aren't perfect. Flynn makes mistakes, he keeps disappearing, they have communication issues, but they never let that break them. They work through all of their problems. They are in love, they know that they're soulmates, so they push through every obstacle they encounter because they know that they want to be together. And in the end, they decide to tether themselves to the library for all eternity, which is even more of a commitment than getting married, and I am not okay and I will never be okay. I also love that Eve being in a relationship with Flynn never negatively impacts her character. She is a badass. She is the leader. She is the mother of the group. She kicks ass with or without Flynn by her side. She is a full character in her own right and she doesn't need a man. But she loves him and he loves her and that's what a relationship should be. They are the best. Now into the top three and at number three we have Sean Hastings and Rebecca Crane from the Assassin's Creed franchise. Only I was tracking this stuff years ago. I must have been, what, 14, 15? You knew Abstergo was a Templar company? No, not at first. I just knew they were up to no good, and I figured maybe I could do something about it. So I started digging up everything I could on the company, posting stuff to news groups, trying to spread the word, looking for people who might have stories to tell. You must have gotten Abstergo's attention. Well, fortunately, I got Rebecca's first. Otherwise, I'd probably be at the bottom of a river. You're welcome. Yeah, she tried to warn me, told me I was messing with the wrong kind of people. And what did you do? I thought you were mental. But now you know better. Yeah, now I know you're just a bit mental. Long story short, I saved his ass multiple times. Should have dropped him and let Abstergo have their way. Listen to you, trying to be all badass. <laughs> Oh god. Sean and Rebecca have the distinction of being the only pairing on this list where the franchise is still in production, meaning that I still have the chance of getting more content from them. And I think that's why I have a different reaction whenever they are brought up, because I'm like still actively in the trenches for this ship and it's a nightmare. Sean and Rebecca, I love you, it's ruining my life. <laughs> So Sean and Rebecca are, to date, the longest serving characters in the Assassin's Creed franchise and the characters with the most appearances across the entire series. They were introduced in Assassin's Creed 2 and went on to appear in Brotherhood, Revelations 3, Black Flag, Initiates, Syndicate, Valhalla and Nexus, as well as Sean appearing in Unity and AC Gold-ish, Rebecca appearing in The Last Descendants, Tomb of the Can novel and both of them being added to the Brotherhood of Venice board game via an expansion pack. I shipped these two right from the beginning, right from Sean revealing that Rebecca saved his life. I was, it was just so blatantly obvious that he was in love with her, like blatant. He might as well have been carrying around a neon sign saying I'm in love with Rebecca Crane. And the two of them danced around their feelings for years and it drove me insane, like there were so many moments. There are things a computer can't do, Rebecca. Like love. Like love. And this is Rebecca, my partner. Uh, in crime. And she's great, isn't she? And she's my very best friend in the world. And Rebecca taking a literal bullet for him. And Sean like, stay with me, Bex, please. I'll stop. The point is, it got to the point where I genuinely thought that they would never get together and that the writers were just like going to leave them as these flirtatious besties forever trolling me. Then Assassin's Creed Valhalla came out and I was going through the Animus Anomalies and Sean just casually drops in that they got married. <laughs> married? I actually threw my phone, I remember, I was on the couch and I just like chucked it across the room as if it was on fire. Like, I was so shocked, I was just like, ah! <laughs> and then in one of the database entries, Sean mentioned that they're thinking of having a baby and I was just... Darby McDevitt, you have my whole heart for finally making them canon. Darby has always shipped these two, he said it before, and the sheer audacity to like walk into the writer's room of Assassin's Creed and be like, by the way, this is going to be canon and then all of the future writers have to work with that because the way that Assassin's Creed works you write something in and then the future writers just have to deal with it so he was like if I write in that these two are married then everyone in the future has to accept it and that's just gonna have to be canon from now on what a guy what a hero I don't know whether I'll see Sean and Rebecca again such as the nature of the Assassin's Creed modern day at this point but if and when they do, I will be there sobbing my eyes out, just like I have been for the past 12 years of my life. My precious Blorbos, I would walk through fire for you forever. 
And number two, we have Piper Hallowell and Leo Wyatt from Charmed. I can't use a clip for this couple because when I tried that before, the WB blocked the entire video. But anyway, for me, this couple are so, so close to being number one, but they are just beaten out by, well, I'm sure you can guess by now. <laughs> I always describe Charmed as the show that raised me. I started watching it when I was three years old, and as a result, I can't remember my life without it. Those characters and that world have always been there for me. And even as a tiny child, I was obsessed with the relationship between Piper and Leo. I had no idea what fandom or shipping was back then. All I knew was that Dan was a loser and that Piper needed to dump him and go back to Leo. And when they split up at the end of season five, I was ready to throw hands. Piper and Leo taught me what love is. That's not an exaggeration. I watched them go to hell and back for each other and for their relationship, being torn apart by angels, demons and fate itself, but always finding their way back to each other. And how incredibly lucky I am all these years later to have the actors discuss that relationship weekly on their Charmed Rewatch podcast. I know it's currently on hiatus, but it will be back. Piper and Leo are just the love story and I will defend them with my life. I still have the note that Leo wrote for Piper, the card that says I'm a handyman again, the same man that you fell in love with, the same man who fell in love with you, memorised, as well as Piper's I will stand in this very spot until you send Leo back to me speech. Like they all live rent free in my head. Their wedding vows, like all of it just permanently etched on my brain like a hieroglyphic wall painting in a pyramid. Essentially the reason that I can't do maths is because that part of my brain is actually filled with storing 200 episodes of Charmed and just playing them on an infinite loop. <laughs> and at number one we have Cornelia Hale and Caleb from the Witch TV series. If Count Dorkula knew how close he came to becoming Snake Chow? Oh my gosh, Napoleon! Help me. Leave that to me. Try again, sweetie. Just gotta put the right spin on it. Oh, totally. There's the cat. Coming as a surprise to exactly no one, my favourite chef of all time is Cornelia and Caleb from the Witch TV series. I realised that at 28 years old, my favourite chef probably shouldn't be a 14 and a 16 year old. But you have to remember that they have been in my life since I was nine. So back then, they seemed so grown up to me. Although that's like hilarious to me in retrospect. I suppose in reality though, the reason that they are still my favourite ship is because they feel familiar. Much like Piper and Leo, Cornelia and Caleb have been in my life for so long that they really are comfort characters, a comfort relationship. I said in my 20 years of Witch love letter video that during my lonely and friendless years, Witch were my friends. It was a world that I retreated into when I had nowhere to go in my real life. And as a result, I suppose Cornelia and Caleb feel like home to me. They're comforting, nostalgic, and frozen in time. Because we've never got any more witch since 2006, so they exist in this perfect piece of history that can never be touched, never be messed with. And for me, that's a safe place to go, because no one can ever mess with it. If you do want to hear my full, unfiltered and unhinged thoughts on this ship, you're in luck because I have a three-part retrospective about their relationship on my channel. I highly encourage you to watch it. It's a wild ride. It originally had me singing The Great War by Taylor Swift in it, but then I had to edit it out because it got copyright striked, but it's just because the record label clearly don't appreciate art. And that's it. Those are my tw top 25 favourite fandom ships of all time. Let me know your opinions in the comments, roast me about Rachel and Joey or any other ship on the list and tell me what your favourite fictional couples are and I will see you in whatever I post next. Bye everyone!